So I was recently watching one of my favorite comedians of all time. His name is Jerry Seinfeld. And in one of his bits, he talks about fears. And he explains that the number one fear that the average human being will hold is public speaking. Which means, and this is part of his bit that I'm borrowing, that at a funeral, most people would rather be the person who's dead as opposed to the one who's eulogizing at that time. I was supposed to laugh. It was funny. Oh, <laughs> your dad died you My question to the boys in this room is, what is public speaking amongst other areas in life, but what about public speaking do you feel like is difficult? You're putting yourself out there and like, you know, you don't know if everybody's going to agree with you, so if it's just you. Good, so now what emotion do we likely feel when we're put in a scenario like public speaking? Nervous. Anxiety. Nervous. Any other Fair. thoughts? Anxiety. Fear. Anxiety. Anxiety. Ding, ding, ding. Buzzword. Very good. Thank He's you, right. Nervous. Welcome. So, according to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, one out of every five Americans suffer from a mental illness known as anxiety. Now, before we explore this very overwhelming topic, I want to first go over some basics of what is and what is not anxiety, and then we'll see where it kind of goes in. But before we start, we have to recognize something. This topic is so big that what we'll cover today is likely just scratching the surface of what entails this heavy topic. But we'll do our part to create awareness and to figure out what these ideas can mean for us in our own respective classroom. Firstly, our brains are hardwired to detect things that will interfere with our survival. Anxiety has this label as like evil and bad and scary. But before we unpack it, we have to first recognize that it's something that's very integral and important to our everyday life. The fact that we can feel an emotion that helps us better understand how to navigate our decision making is very crucial, right? If I didn't feel nervous, about something, I may not do the necessary preparatory work in order to make sure that I'm best ready for that moment. So just staying in, in this classroom right here, right? I know I've met with a lot of you about your high school interviews. That's been something that's made you feel nervous. Now, if you didn't have this feeling yeah. called anxiety, and you didn't recognize that it made you feel a certain way, Maybe, just maybe, you wouldn't have done what you did in order to prepare for the moment. So before we start off about how anxiety goes haywire, let's first recognize that anxiety and anxious feelings are very important and necessary for our everyday life. Now, let's go to the other extreme. There is what's called an anxiety disorder, okay? And basically, to some, and again, I'm, I'm not comprehensively going through this like I should, but for all intents and purposes, the disorder will happen when I am experiencing and I'm processing so much information that the overwhelming amount that I am processing, I perceive as a threat, and I am so concerned with whatever it is that's bothering me or worrying me. So there's a whole criteria of what goes into this anxiety disorder. I'll cover a couple, right? The first one is that I am more worried than not worried on, in, in my everyday life, right? And then secondly, something else that helps me to recognize that it's too much is it'll manifest itself in a physiological way. So it may cause me to uh, have a high heart rate. It may cause me to sweat. It may cause me to throw up. It may cause me to have a hard time sleeping. Anxiety becomes anxiety the way we know it when it's not just helping me detect a fear, but when it gets in the way of my everyday life. When I can't sleep, 
when I can't focus, when I can't think because I'm so worried about the fact that I'm worried. So now somewhere in between survival skills and disorder, right, there's a large spectrum that according to the statistics, one out of every five Americans will end up in what we call generalized anxiety, right? So it's not so extreme where maybe it's aggressive in nature that I can't focus at any given moment in my life. But at the same time, it's not necessarily helping me survive, it's interfering with my everyday life. So we need to explore what exactly is going on and why exactly it's going on. And so, I mentioned the statistic of one in every five Americans will experience this mental illness. What I didn't share with you is that only 38% of people will actually do something about the mental illness that they have, recognized as anxiety. Very, very poor showing, and I think that there's a good reason why. Stigma of mental health. So the stigma of mental health that Ray is mentioning is important, yes, but I'm gonna take it one step further and talk about Let's get in the head of somebody who might be experiencing this difficulty. They don't want to think that. But it's more than that, right? I'm worried about things that are going on in my life, right? What do you think is happening to the person who typically will worry? He's going to worry about the fact that he's worried all the time. So my capacity and my ability to get the attention that I need and to get the support that I need is likely not happening because what do people do when we worry? We withdraw from life. We say to ourselves, I can't get involved with the very thing that causes me stress and concern. It's too scary, it's too nerve wracking. I need to stay away and so most people when push comes to shove, statistically speaking, will refrain from doing what they need to do in order to overcome this very, very difficult hardship. So there are a number of techniques that go into anxiety that I want to talk about a couple with you. Again, just scratching the surface, but the techniques that I'm going to focus on I think will echo a very, very loud message that I would like to share with everybody here in this room. The first technique that we use when people have anxiety is called exposure, okay? Exposure is when an individual, an individual gradually will introduce himself to the very thing that causes him anxiety, and so from then on he'll develop a tolerance to the point where he can get in front of whatever it is that's bothering him. So, let's jump into the Jerry Seinfeld uh, bit for a second. Public speaking. If I have a fear of public speaking and it causes me so much anxiety and stress that I refrain from doing it, the research will show that if you can start small with baby steps and maybe just talk in front of your parents at home, maybe just talk in front of a few of your friends, and then gradually you increase how many people you speak in front of to the point where eventually you can feel comfortable public speaking in any given forum in any given time. Exposure. The second one that I want to highlight is something that perhaps you've seen in action but never really paid much attention to it. Boys, did you ever notice before a sports game what athletes will do to prepare? Deep breathing and stretching. These are things that they do because they recognize that they're about to engage in a very high stressful act. And so what they need to do for their own mental health is they need to calm themselves down. And you might notice NBA players at the foul line taking a couple of deep breaths before they go through their routine. You might notice in between games, people stretching. What are they doing? They're calming their body down because their body is perceiving, their brains are recognizing and processing information as a threat. And so these techniques want to say, hold on, pump the brakes for a second. Before we write this off as life-threatening, let's calm down a little bit. Let's first analyze, is this really life-threatening or is it not that, but I still need to do my part in order to be in the best frame of mind in order to deal with the nerves and the emotions that I'm currently experiencing? 
And these techniques echo a much louder message, and they say the following, in my opinion. Anxiety, when you hear the word, automatically, I think, people get afraid. They say to themselves, this is the handicap of my life. They say to themselves, this is the very thing that it disables me to be my best self. We look at it in a way because how many people are suffering and are dealing with this very difficult hardship that we say to ourselves, I need to move away from what is hurting me, which is conventional wisdom. But the techniques would say otherwise. The science would say, you want to really deal with stress and nerves and emotions called anxiety? You want to really deal with it? Head on. We don't run away from it. We go forward and we deal with whatever it is that is getting in our way. Because once I can be vulnerable enough to say, here's what's happening to me, here's what's interfering with me being my best self, now let's go to work and utilize some of the techniques that are out there in the world in order to overcome what is getting in my way, then and only then do people have the best fighting chance to overcome what overwhelms most of America, potentially most of the world. Boys, one out of every five Americans have what's called anxiety. 38% will choose to do something about it. What will you do? What statistic would you like to be? Think about it. Shabbat Shalom.